Welcome to another Liquid Bullet Productions. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background into the latest interview that Lee has coming up with Ray Gilbert, who served 36 years in prison for a crime he claims he did not commit and was forced into making a false confession to. Ray Gilbert was convicted of the murder of John Suffield Jr. In 1981, a 23-year-old John was stabbed 19 times in his workplace the Coral Bookmakers in Lodge Lane, Chopstiff, Liverpool. On the morning of the 13th of February 1981, John turned up at his place of employment early as he was meeting a representative from Coral Bookmakers to hand back the keys. He had earlier decided to leave his job after a run-in with two unknown males in the bookmakers in the days prior to his murder. Unfortunately, the coral representative was running late. In the meantime, John sustained 19 stab wounds to the torso and horrific injuries to his right eye and mouth. The bookies were splattered in blood. Within three days, Ray was arrested on the suspicion of murder and then later charged with murder alongside his co-accused, John Kamara. And welcome to another Liquid Bullet Productions. Joining me today is Mr. Ryan Gilbert. Thanks for coming, Ray. Thank you for having me, Lee. How are you today? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. So, Raymond, he was convicted of a miscarriage of justice for a murder charge and, a murder charge and served 36 years in prison. That That's right, yes. So, before we get into this, Ray, can we just start from the beginning and get a little bit of your background and sort of where you brought up and stuff? Uh, born in 1958, Liverpool, uh, originally Toxteth, uh, I moved from Toxteth to Croxteth and you're knocking the old Toxteth down, then moved up to Speak, um, from Speak I went in and out of care from, the, uh, from about one up till six, and then I went into care full time at the age of eight, in and out from children's homes all, all over Liverpool till I was 15. Went home, 15, tried it, didn't work. Ended up uh, getting involved in petty crime. Got a borstal in 1974, come out 75. Got another borstal 76, come out in 77. Then got six months in 77, was out all 78. Got six months again, 79, the petty stuff. And then got six months in 1980, come out 1981. And within four weeks of coming out, I was nicked for this. So just, just, from, just jump back there when you said about the ball stools, right? How, how did you find them or how was, how was sort of life in the ball stools? Uh, ball in my day, it was, uh, it was racist, not from staff, but from... Cons, uh, the, the wing I I was on at the time was like black black prisoners were actually getting beaten up. What just for no reason, just yeah, just, just black yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was uh, otherwise it wasn't bad. I mean, the, the the four wings were separate. The two top wings, I think, south and south and west. No, north and west was down. Or was it north and south was for the scousers? East and west was for the manx. So you didn't really socialise, even though you worked in in the same workplaces. Used to be a big passageway. Used to be nicknamed the M1. Used to be all kinds of battles down at M1. They used to meet scousers and manx and just fight mad. That's quite a hard sort of. Uh... Did, did you find sort of people, because of the racism in there, sort of separated people into gangs and that type of stuff? Uh, no, because in, in the, them days in Boston, it was like you had sort of like a uh, cock of the wing. Right. You know what I mean? Which was the sort of a attitude that, that it was them. So you'd have a geezer with cock of the wing. You had a group who were all... Uh, in a dormitory that thought they were better than everybody else. So you had a, a, a hierarchy, you know what I mean? Uh, 
we're from this part of Liverpool. We're better than you. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> unfortunately, that's that's how it, how it was. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see, did you see much sort of bullying and that going on in there to sort of like uh, young people? Not com- uh, no, not compared to what I've I've heard, like when YPs in the say late eighties, nineties, when they used to go to one of the bosses I actually went to, which was in the Boston in Wigan, people were getting robbed for the trainers in the reception. So there was a lot of bullying going on. I mean the mindset now of youngsters is completely different to what it was then. Yeah, it must be, it must be quite hard though to sort of um to sort of your youth then was sort of spent in bolsters in and out and sort of up, up to sort of what sort of age was you when you finally sort of come out? Uh the first bolster I was fifteen, come out when I was sixteen. My second one was uh, 17 and uh, I come out just before I was 18. Yeah. I mean, so, so did you find that that sort of led you into the sort of petty crime, like worse while you was in there with others or? I, I think probably uh, growing up in, in care and then when I first went home in 74, things didn't work out between me mother and uh, me so I just drifted into petty crime I was uh, living rough sometimes I was staying in people's houses and I was just doing pettiness robbing from houses burglaries cars uh, robbing people on the street just to survive that's what I was going to say was it for like a survival purpose though not not for fun, it was more because you needed it, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's probably was my mindset. I mean, I was of the attitude that because of what I'd gone through uh, as a child, I was blaming society for what my mother put me through. So yeah. I wasn't thinking about nothing else. I was just, people said, yeah, yeah, come on. Let's, let's go and do this. So I was probably doing stuff to actually fit in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then moving on from the ball stools, you actually, what was your first sentence for, mate? Uh, my first sentence was for unlawful wounding. What you call in this day and age gang fights, you had gang fights then. Well, yeah. they didn't like use what they're using now. You know what I mean? Where it's postcode, you could go from one side of the street to the other and you're, you're getting killed for, for being in the wrong postcode. Yeah. But back, going back to the 70s, like, because I, I was in care and like the school that I used to go to, people used to come from all over certain parts of Liverpool. So I was living in Tubruk at the time and the kids from Tubruk. West Derby, Daysbrook, Dovecott, uh, and another screen used to go go to that school. So I was socialising with people from Tubruk and from another uh, screen, and I knew a couple of the lads from school from Daysbrook and Dovecott. So I started mixing with them, and then we started getting labelled at school as the Dirty Dozen. So anything that went wrong, they would put it on us. Yeah. So that was my descent into sort of criminality with this group, where we used to go to the local shop, which was on on the corner of the school, all pile in. While someone's getting served and the person who worked in there has got the back turn, we'd be taking stuff and just walking out. Yeah. And then we used to have an ice cream van that used to come in into the school. And we'd all surround it and start tipping it, like trying to get it to go over. So we'd jump out, we'd jump in and rob it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just mad. And then they'd be chasing me around the uh, school because I look different to what I used to look. Uh, my dad's side... Coloured, my mum's signs is white. 
So it'll be chasing me around the fucking schoolyard. This fella, it's the nigger. Get him. I'll be like that. What? And I think I was the only coloured kid in, in our school. Oh, so, really? Yeah, well, it okay. used to be mad because you know what? We play poker dice. We'd have the owl poker dice. Yeah. In, in class, we'd sit there, play poker dice. We'd play poker with cards drink and, and smoke, we just wouldn't learn. We were in the bottom two forms. There were seven form, seven classes in each form. And basically the bottom two sections, they, they didn't care. You just did whatever you yeah. wanted. I so, suppose as well, if you're not paying attention and the teachers can see you're not interested, I suppose they'll just let you get on with it a little bit, do they? No, they, back in that day, they tried, because don't forget, you actually had the cane in them days. And oh, I used yeah, to be... Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I yeah. yeah, I used to be outside the off office virtually every day, getting chicks of the best off the uh, headmaster <laughs> for all their kinds. Honestly, it was just mad. We used to have a go out on the exercise on on the yard, which was the third, fourth, and fifth year, which was separate from the first and second year. Now, if I told you I was in care, right? I used to come out the back gate for care. Just come out the gate. We lived in a little grove, three big houses. And as we come out the entrance, the entrance to the third, fourth, and fifth year was there. And the first and second year was behind. So if I wanted to sag, I just have to climb over over the school gate or go out the other way. So people who were in the, in the home didn't see me. I mean, so... I was like that, wow, you know what I mean? Right next door to it. So we used to have the yard, this big wagon place right right next door to the yard. So we always, the uh, break time, always used to play poker dice on, on a wall. And then we suddenly started smashing up these brand new wagons. And again, it, it was me, even though these uh, gang of us doing it, it was like, it's the nigga, get him. I used to be like that, running in and out of school and all trying to hide. It was fucking mad. It was, was a taste where... You were pretty much laid with the target out of the group then. Uh, well, they used to target us all, but I was of the attitude where I didn't think. I just yeah. just used to act. I didn't care about what, what happened. I was uh, so uh, blamed everybody in this society for this is everyone else's fault when basically the person's fault who it was everybody knew who it was but family tried to give me a home on uh, my dad's side but my mother didn't want me having any anybody treating treating me good yeah so that's why i ended up in in care she's saying she couldn't cope and i was thinking well what am i doing wrong you know what I mean? I was the fourth kid, and yet I was the one who's being treated like shit. They were all told, treat him the same way that I am. So my man used to kick fuck out of me. My dad couldn't do nothing because he suffered from epilepsy. So he used to spend most of his day upstairs in bed. So if I, as a kid growing up, I used to get thrown on the, on the bed next next door to him and just, just get left while they're doing whatever. So they were told to treat me the same as uh, my man. What what was the reason for that? Why, why did, did you get treated like that? I don't know. I mean, I heard she, I, I looked look like my dad. So she she didn't like that. So uh, things were going on at home where uh, my mother used to work the streets I have been told she used to run brothels back then and uh my dad couldn't do fuck all because of his illness. Now he, he used to be able to handle himself. I mean when you got to in to a place called Rain Hill, it's half it was a hospital plus a like a psychiatric place. He said he never had anyone like him. He was so fit. But when I first met him from care he was just strapped to a big massive wheelchair about that I the old fashioned wheelchairs. Yeah. And I used to just wheel him around. He wasn't using his legs. So he used to be left in the in the bedroom and 
I'd come home from school or whatever, and uh, I'd be asked to go out, buy some stuff from the mobile vans. Remember the vans that used to have, have stuff? I used yeah. to go and get stuff, bring it back, and I wouldn't be given nothing. So I'd end upstairs, upstairs on, on the bed next to uh, my dad while they they really do more ever. So I wasn't part of their, their life. I mean, don't get me wrong. We tried to fix it while I've, I've been out. But uh, something happened where my brother's daughter got found dead uh, a c- couple of years ago. Now, I wasn't talking to me, but I was inside when she ended up getting 18 months for uh, perverting the course of justice. And uh, she started smoking weed in that. So I've come out. I used to have her around me flat. I used to give her food. Give a cash and some of my other cousins did. So they, they were saying, oh, don't give her nothing, have nothing to uh, do uh, with her. So when uh, she got found dead, cousins then on her side of the family were like, oh, it's his fault. Why, why didn't he do nothing about it? I'm thinking, oh, hang on. She's been out for however long she's been out. You, you all knew what was going on. So why didn't any of you stop it? You're their parents. So why are you looking to blame other people? Yeah. Why don't you take responsibility? You know what I mean? So I haven't spoke spoke to them since then. So Ray, how, how did you end up getting caught up in this miscarriage of justice? I mean, what what is the story there and, and how did you become involved in it? Uh, my name got uh, put, in, put in over something else which a couple of months before, which was nothing to do with, with, with the... Murder, but when the murder happened, they, sh- they were told that they should have been informed about this link, which was a tenuous link over over it. So, in 1980, or was it 80? I used to live in and twist lights, and one day we've come out with a copper tank. So we're walking down waste ground at the back and we've been stopped by uh, old Bill. So I think you've asked me details about the address, who lived there. I said me. He said his name's on, on the rent book. I went me. So they let me go and took the other two in to Wavy to Road police station. So one kid took the charge and the other kid's supposed to have asked for them meeting with police. So they've gone to the cell, spoke to him, and he's supposed to have given my name in for the jobs. So that's how I came to the attention of this murder squad. Right. So it was uh, from there, it's like, un- unbeknown at the time, this murder had happened. He'd been threatened the day before by two people over dodgy bets. Uh, they one lived at the back used to be a pub at the back of Buttermere Street which one entrance come out on Lawton Street and one entrance come out on Buttermere Street at the back of the betting shop now what's happened is the girl whose flat it was she was at home three people turned up when these all got uh, arrested with the two girls when it in in the bedroom and they were discussing one of the other kids who'd been pulled in who'd been questioned they were concerned that he might change his story so because of what she heard she left the flat and went to stay with her brother so she was concerned for their own safety yeah. and then you had uh, the original two suspects were actually pulled in and questioned and they were in a eliminated within by by the uh, Saturday night it's then in the paper then that the original suspects but when you study I mean we we don't know if it's them we can't we don't know it's just if you study all the undisclosed evidence now they were supposed to have made a journey from Selborne Street in Toxter to town by car. I should have only took five minutes or 10 minutes at the most to where 
and they were going they were going to drop a car back off. It took forty five minutes, and they've all like given each other alibis. But some of the things that they're trying to do to state they were with each other don't add up. But it doesn't mean to say that it's them. Two other people were seen running down the side street where you got the betting shop. You've got the bingo wall right next door to it. Or two people were seen running down that street, Beaumont Street, which used to, on the as you go down that way on this side, which is the right hand side, used to be a row of masonettes all the way down to a pub called the Clock Public House. Two people seen running down, running in into one of the masonettes, coming out with a change of clothing each. And a kid wanted to go with them and one of them turned out to the kid said, you can't come with us, we've got to get away. Now, what did they have to get away for? Two of the kids were seen running across waste ground at the top of, at the top of Parley, Upper Parliament Street, you've got Upper Parliament Street here, Smithdown Road there, Earl Road there, Tunnel Road there, and Lodge Lane here. But at the top of Smithdown used to be waste ground. So two people were seen running across Waste ground by people working up on the church roof. Yeah. And I never been traced. And then these three young girls were seen going in and out of a back entrance to where the betting shop was with keys trying to open something. Never traced. So they eliminated them. And next minute, the looting firm for me. And and me mate, so I'm, I'm going up to me cousins on the Monday afternoon who lived at the bottom of Lodge Lane at, at, at the time. So I never paid no attention and heard a car go <laughs> screech, which was a normal thing for Lodge Lane because it's like uh, cars are just coming out and don't care if there's traffic coming out. They're just doing their U-turns or whatever. If they end up getting it, they end up getting it. So next minute, I've been jumped on. I'm being dragged in, in there to a car and I've said, yeah, what the fuck's going on? And the, the attitude was you'll find out at the cop shop. So I, I wasn't told until I actually got to the police station. I was being... So how could you didn't know anything about a murder or such? You no. You anything about nothing? No. So uh, I got uh, taken to Admustry police station and I was told I was arrested on suspicion of murder. My head just went, wow, what the fuck's going on here? So they put me in the cell. And uh, they come and question me in, in the cell. Didn't take no notes, nothing. So they asked me where I was. I said, I was in bed with with a girl. I said, what time do you wake up? I said, about seven o'clock. What happened? Did you leave the flat? I said, no, we ended up having a argument in, in the flat so we had an argument over there sleeping with me co-accused so i ended up going downstairs to the flat uh, to the shops downstairs to get fire lighters for the fire and newspaper so i went downstairs i got um, probably between eight and nine got some fire lighters to eat the fire up so you could have Hot, hot water. In the old days, you used to put coal fire lighters, you know, the old staff fashion way, for, for your water. So, yeah. I've done that, come back, uh, put it on, and uh, stayed in all, all day. Only time I left was to go and sign on. I had to sign on the police station every night at six. I was on bail for the robbery of of a old man in in, in his house. And uh, no idea, so they've gone away, come back, I don't know how long later, in a cell, it wasn't a proper windows, it's the opaque windows where you can't see out of, so you can right, see so where it's... What, what age are you here now? So what age is this happening now? Uh, 1981, so I would say just... Whew, uh, 58, 68, 78, 22. Oh, still young. Yeah. Still so, yeah. They've come back in a second time and asked me some more questions which were not written down or even re 
recorded. So we've gone away and then shoot me out the third time and shoot me into a holding room by the charge desk. And that's where the games started. So come in, we slammed two photo fits on the table. And he went, that's you, that's your mate. Said, From the information we've got, you're, you're the heavy man, he's the bad man. So I'm like that, thinking, where are you, where are you getting this information from? So it was like, browbeat, browbeat, browbeat. And because I wouldn't accept that the two photo fits were, were me, one, they started then playing bad cop, good cop. Yeah. And it reached the stage where one of them jumped on me. So we had a struggle. He grabbed me round the neck. We both gone down to the floor. He got up. Ran out the fucking room, come back in about 10 minutes later and said, that's how you kill the disease. So then it was like that constantly, it's you, it's you. I've got 15 years left in the job. He's got 10. You ain't getting out until we retire. I was just thinking to myself, wow, fuck me, I haven't done fuck all here. You know what I mean? So, so, so right, did they actually... Sort of disclose what had happened in this murder, like how this guy had been killed, or did they give any clues of that at this point, or were they still not sort of? No, they were. Them? No, they were too adamant that, judging by the photo fits, they wanted me to to say who, who they were. Now, yeah. I didn't know who, who they were. I, I did say I recognised one, but I don't know who he, who he is by your name. But they were like that. It's you, it's you, and that's him. And that's all it was, it's you, 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 you. And he was just constantly at it, at it, at it. No, I mean, I think fucking... And why I fucking gave in, I don't know. I mean, I was scared. I'd already been jumped on the floor, fucking hell. And all the time I've been nicked before, I've never been attacked. Yeah. Now, okay, I'm living in Toxteff. And Toxtiff at the time was a hotbed of uh, racism towards the coloured community where they were taking people, pulling them in, uh, taking them for rides, beating them up, dropping them off from there, falsifying charges and everything. So it was in that era where the riots kicked off. So you've got police blatantly targeting the coloured community. But I I didn't think nothing of that. I'm just thinking, wow, I'm a vulnerable kid who's been diagnosed as emotionally damaged as, as a kid. And I'm thinking, what do they mean by by that? You know, I had no idea what the what they meant. I mean it was only in the when I actually got my social services file when I was in Woodhill special unit that I was reading the file and I thought, wow, someone diagnosed me as being emotionally damaged. Now, because of the beatings I got as as a kid, I used to have a skin condition which used to erupt through stress. I also had a speech impediment like the, the victim had where I couldn't get my words out. So if I'm sitting there and sometimes I'm quiet, they're automatically uh, human. I've got something to hide. But it was just me. If I can't get words out, I used to stand there sometimes when I used to, like in court sometimes, when I went to court trying to get me word out to say not guilty or guilty when I'd been previously nicked or when I used to go and put applications in on, on certain wings, people would be standing there being angry, waiting like that. Can't this kid hurry, hurry up? So I think they assumed automatically that I was guilty because, one, I was quiet. It wasn't to do with quiet. It was to do with the speech impediment. Yeah. And uh, so it just went from from there. So I think there was no... Like, did they have any evidence to sort of like, put forward to you for this case? No, there was no 
evidence whatsoever. There's no ID. He said... So there was no like, witnesses, no DNA? There was, no, there was witnesses, but the witnesses, I did not get ID'd. I went on an ID parade. They never yeah. picked me out. I went on an ID parade. Mine was okay. There was 12 people on mine. When he went on his, it was dodgy. So me just his boyfriend at the time got ID'd on my parade. Now, whether he got questioned or not, I don't think he did because I've never seen nothing where he was questioned. So there was no forensic to link either of, of us. I mean, the only blood was my own blood on a shirt and on bed sheets. Because of the, I had some mad condition that come under epidermis dermatitis. So I used to scratch badly. So I used to have specks of blood all over my own gear, my clothes in their beds. That was mine. So the blood test that come back showed, I think it was, uh, was it R plus two or P plus two plus one? It was my group. So it had no... You know, linking at all. And, and you say that that was just on your own clothing, though. Like, yeah, like, just, like, just a couple of clothing. No, yeah, it's a. Uh, I'm not sure if it's here. Uh, somewhere, because I'm, I'm up, all, always uh, doing, working on, on stuff. And it was like, okay, this is the. Forensic scientist, uh, is like where he said the he took the footwear, took footwear, and he said the footwear marks on the linoleum do, uh, do not correspond to the shoes of the deceased. Uh, items relating to me, the two were clothing, bedding, knives, and then it's got on 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 the bottom uh, my. Blood group is PGM 2 plus 1 plus. Traces of blood are present on the following items. Group testing have been carried out on a possible blood, which was shared, my own shared, pullover, nothing, shared, insufficient, cardigan, nothing, jumper, nothing, pillowcase and sheet 2 plus, 2 plus 1 plus, which is my own blood from my yeah. skin. Dave put. Therefore, the blood on the test RGM 10, 16, 18 could have been shed by me only, no one else. Yeah. He found no other blood on any other items relating to me. The shoes have not made the footwear marks in the blood at the betting office. Uh, and then on, on the bottom here, fibre transference. I found no fiber transference of contact between the clothing of me and the victim. Yeah. So, so right, was, can I just ask you, so how was the victim actually murdered? He was stabbed 18 times, tied up and uh, beaten, beaten up for, uh, for people to actually yeah. give them the numbers to the safe. So yeah. it was tied up. I mean, the way they've tied them up is weird because we, we tried to draw a picture of the way the hands were tied. And it's it's a weird picture. And uh, the drawing we did, I don't think we did justice the way we drew it. But someone reckons it's probably someone who's got experience in being a sailor. But he was tied up with his hands are sort of in front with loops around him. Lying down with his coat on. Yeah. But what is see strange is there was a metal grill to the entrance which was open, a jar on the pavement, so people had to go walk onto the road to get past it. Now a board marker used to gain entrance through shouting through the door. On this day, he didn't turn up at his normal time. He acted completely out of character. He's uh, he's gone up at a time. It's probably between half nine and ten. And uh, he's seen the gate open, open the letterbox, 
seen the lights on, shouted through, didn't get no answer. He's walked away to speak to someone else on the corner of Upper Parliament Street. He worked in the other betting shop as, as a board marker. So a greengrocer, he used to go and collect the papers, which the betting shop man used to go collect, come up to drop two papers off, which hadn't been picked up. So he's seen the board mar marker talking to someone, so he'd give him the papers because he couldn't get an answer. So the board marker waited for one of the females, cashier, to turn up. She went, then he decided to, to go to the shop with her, shout through. When they didn't get no answer, he then contacted the old Bill. So he'd already been there and seen something wasn't right, but didn't uh, contact nobody, which I found was strange. In the police station, false confession was made. I admit that. Uh, so so who, then, what, you made a confession yourself? I made a false one, yeah. What, saying you've done it? Yeah. What I was the reasoning for that, Raymond? What? I think I was, you know what? I think I was just constantly being badgered, pressurised, being threatened, and never been in that situation before. Having nobody there to give us that support I probably needed, I went, yeah, okay, it's me, when it wasn't me. Oh, did, did you feel like you was led into like a false pretense, like you admit it and we let you off that type of sort of business, or yeah, yeah. just to get out of there, that type of thing? Yeah, well, that's... I thought, I said, well, okay, yeah. I didn't even think of the consequences of uh, my yeah. actions. I didn't know what, well, okay, yeah, you know what I mean? I didn't think that it would create what it created. I mean, it, yeah. it caused a lot of shit. I, I, I actually hold, hold my hands up to that. But what's gone on? There's only been a one-sided version come out. Yeah. So he pulled in me co-defending him. So he got charged. So we went to the main bridewell in Liverpool over, overnight on the Thursday to appear in court. He was four people in the cell with us waiting to go up. One person asked us what we were there for. We told him, he said he knew the victim's family. So nothing got said. So he got took out. And then the co-accused knew this kid in the corner from Walton. They they got talking. Next minute, months down the line, two of them have made statements to say that we come come best to it. So every week we were going to court, we were taking people out of the cells asking them questions blatantly on the bench, right in front of the cell door to see what we said. So it was reaching the stage now. When we went to Risley, other people, months down the line, then made statements as well to say that we come confessed. So at the time, there was only the that false confession. So it ended up with was both having the same brief. Now, I turned out of the brief as soon as I had the opportunity when I haven't done it. It's a false confession. He said, okay. So we had the same brief. Then one one day in April, 81, he decides to ask for an interview with this. So I'm coming out down the steps and got put in into the owl threat box. So you could look out. But I don't think people could actually see you. So I've seen him in the room with a brief and two, two old Bill. The next week, I had to sack the brief we both had for a different brief because he said conflict of in, in interest. So he was told to tell me why. He didn't he just come up with some stupid fucking excuse? I can't really... Sounds a little bit like someone got to them first and told them like to step away or something, didn't it? It sounds a bit like... Yeah. Well, no. Maybe the police involved in it have said leave this case it's like he's just yeah. wanting to confess or something yeah so then it was a case of uh, all the way up to Kim Mittel he then produced 
three of the prisoners from prison to give evidence at the committal. Um, and every one of them messed up. But then the, the style pendery decided there was still enough to send it for trial. People were... We got one kid who was nicked for rape uh, uh, when he tried to burgle a house. Brought him back from Strange Ways one night. So I'm, it's not a block, but I'm in a kind of block on, on the ground floor uh, on the sea wing in Risby. So this kid's come back from Strange Ways to be weighed off the next day. So the whole jail's give, give, given him a abuse. So he's got called to the door and said, right, Tommy, what did you uh, make your statement for? He said, I didn't make it. He said it was written out for me and told to give it in to the police as a conversation with me. So that's when I thought, fucking hell, someone's trying to stitch me up. Then the other kid who made this one was supposed to do something to do with uh, going back to witnesses. Yes. The three main ones from prison, one was charged with burglary and, and rape. He said that his statement was actually written out for him. The other kid who said that he uh, said me co-accused uh, did something to his bed. Uh, I didn't speak to him. I caught me co-accused having chats with him through the cell window on, on the yard, which was the same with the other kid. The third kid was in the health care when we first went away, where you used to go to health care if you were charged with murder, and the doctor would decide whether you'd get put on the cat A book then. So he's on the ward next door in the next bed to me called accused. I'm not on the ward. I'm actually in a cell. So he's only a chance he's got to talk to me if I decide to go out on the yard. So he's talking every night to me called accused. And suddenly he's come up with this statement saying he spoke to me this, I was doing this and doing that. I'm thinking, nah, that's wrong. So he got moved off out of the Aussie over to the wing. Michael Hughes got put on the same wing. So they were talking to each other every day. These three people ended up in strange ways. He ended up in strange ways, Michael Hughes, because his brother-in-law was supposed to have confessed in 1987 to this crime. Uh, tried to do a, a bunk off the coach outside the magistrates one, one week. So the only got about 15 yards down the road before they were both jumped on. So he was in patches now, Nicole accused. So he ended up going to Strangeways. And then the rumours coming out of there was that people were having access to these people and telling them what to say in court. Uh, notorious criminals from the Toxteth area were supposed to have got involved on behalf of me, co-accused. And they were told to say whatever. So it goes to trial. Uh, the first day, the prosecution stand up and go, that's staying stuff. Next minute, it gets halted. And he took the audio prosecution said something about what one one says, and it just says no. The only way you can open a speech like that is if one if they go in a box and say what you're saying. So if through that jury out, a second jury come in, back got kicked out the next day, then a third jury come in and he just carried on. So the prosecution's done their case. So it was the start of the defence. I was the first person to actually start their defence. So probably half an hour to 45 minutes, I was in the dock uh, before the, the night's day's done. So we're downstairs now in the old Crown Court, Liverpool Crown Court, which was St George's Hall. Now in the cells, you had like a wooden bench and like a wooden, uh, that used to go down like that on the stand. But there was holes in this bench which you communicate with each other. So he's in one cell and I'm I'm in the next. And there's a 
his, his approach was, look, if I get found guilty, you're getting done in. If I don't get found guilty, you're okay. So basically, he was putting me under pressure to go in that dock and say, right, it's me yeah. and it ain't him. So under duress with the two people he actually named, uh, who are no notorious in Liverpool, I think they might be notorious uh, in the prison system in the Northwest as well. So based on the pressure I was getting from him, I went, okay, yeah, okay. I went, went in the dock the next morning and went, it's, it's me, I said, it ain't him. So the trial then carried on without me. He got found guilty. So when the, he got found guilty, he went up, he got a sentence, I think this was 12, but the judge said to me, uh, he gave me a recommendation in open court, which was, I believe you was the knife man. Uh, you was responsible for his death. Uh, you should not be let out until you've done 15. So from then, then on, things have just gradually uh, got worse. Uh, didn't mix with him. He, got, he went wherever he went. He put me wherever I went. So we were kept apart. So I was fighting my corner. He was fighting his uh, corner. He managed to get, uh, I don't know if it was rough justice or trial and error to do a program on them. I think it was 1998. Uh, I sent my documentation out to one of these groups and uh, they lost every single piece of evidence. So whatever they did with that evidence, I don't know, but I'd never got my paperwork back. So he ended up getting an appeal in 2000. They ruled that all the prison evidence was not worth the paper it was written on. My false confession was not worth the paper it, it was written on. So he walked. So everyone was saying to me, well, it's supposed to be a two-man crime. So if he, he's walked and they're saying that there's no evidence it should have been the same for uh, me. But it, it hasn't. So I'm still fighting mine. And it's like, I think him and others are doing everything possible to ensure I don't get my story on. Right, can I just ask you a little bit of sort of obviously, what, what was your solicitor's take on um, on the case when you spoke to your own solicitors? Uh, at the time, uh, yeah. I think because of what had gone on and who who the people were, I don't think they could give me any any other advice because these people I mean oh, staff so were so were your solicitors aware that obviously you're saying it, it that or they said it wasn't you but you can confess and say it was because of the sort of trauma it could bring to you. Uh, solicitors aware of that as well. Yeah well they they wanted to do what uh we tried to, we did get a psychological assessment done for the CCRC in 1998, but we only had one report. If we had had two, we would have got it back to appeal because CCRC, being the joke they are, uh, weren't prepared to send it back based on one report. Now, Unbeknown to us at the time when the trial was going on, we didn't know that evidence had been withheld. So, years down the line, people representing me, Bristol University used to run a miscarriage of justice group in the in the university through students were looking at my case. So they contacted the Liverpool Police to see if there was any uh, documentation or DNA. So they were saying no, and then they found six boxes in in the court, in the cells. So they found six slides that say contain debris of stuff to do with the case. So we've been asking for years to them to conduct DNA. 
and you keep refusing to do DNA. Now, we've always said, well, you can get DNA from things that you found in, in the ice hundreds of, hundreds of years later on, and other cases that might be 40 or 50 years old, dead uh, cold cases reviews, you do DNA and you found it. So why are you refusing to do the test these slides? I mean, what's on them? Where's all the stuff? <clears throat> 214 bits of stuff went to a forensic lab in, in Chorley and other stuff went to a, a lab in West Yorkshire. Now, I've seen the report from Chorley Lab, but I've never seen nothing from the Yorkshire Lab. Now, the Yorkshire Lab got bags which contained money, which was uh, copper coins and silver coins from the crime scene, as well as, I think, the rope that was tied round his hands. Now, stuff like that should be kept for the jaw of someone's sentence. So we don't know if material is still in existence to this day. But uh, basically, they failed. I mean, if it's a two-man crime, as in quite a lot of, of cases with the CCRC, you won't get off and then investigate. You don't carry out DNA. You don't go to the crime scene and feelings for the crime now people are actually moaning about them and, and I think it's it's right, look at the cases that keep going back, that should yeah. go back to appeal, they were set up based uh, uh, <coughs> to, uh, <coughs> on the ground there was a department in the home office called C3 which used to investigate claims of miscarriage of justice. Now, my case was there with them, along with the gold used. So when the CCRC were formed, ours was one of the original cases that went back there. I mean, one of the first cases that went there. And they've been failing people for years. And there's like, there's uh, a thing going on now by Bristol University called Empowering the Innocence. Which, which is char chartering how people are being let down by the CCRC because basically the police on there, the uh, they all lawyers and all that. They're still working together, don't they? The, the CCRC is not really fighting your corner, are they? They just sort of don't really no. want to... It's, it's like they don't really want it uncovered and no. they don't want to spend the money and the cost and embarrassment of them being wrong, I suppose. It's, uh, you're sort of fighting a bit of a losing battle, aren't you? Sort of trying to... Well, you, you think so. You've got to look at it like this, right? Every major case that's gone through their hands, right, okay, you had the Birmingham 6, Guildford 4 and all that, uh, the uh, M M25 3, the Tottenham 3. Yeah, the yes I, one's been going on for years yeah. as well, hasn't it? They've been fighting for years. So why... It's the CCRC. Where do you, where do you supposed to be doubt on the case? It's supposed to go back to a, a appeal court, but the CCRC are acting as judge, jury, and prosecution, which they shouldn't be doing at all. So these people looking to try and get change <coughs> in that body because it's not it's fit for them. Up. The whole the whole system mm. is just terrible. Yeah, they're let, they're letting people down. There's yeah. too many people stagnating in jail for things that they haven't done. Yeah. But, I mean, it's it's wrong. I mean, I haven't met the uh, Essex boys, you know what I mean? Uh, but I, I am aware of their uh, case, you know what I mean? Yeah. So even, even them, you know what I mean? They stout there, send it back to the appeal court and let the judges decide, not yeah. a bunch of people. Who, they might know the law, but they're not prepared to in the rest of the week. They? They no, no, they're not. They they've know. had their budget cut, they've had people cut, so you haven't got enough people, haven't got enough funds to investigate cases, and they're failing down. But that's not the 
only thing, if you look at the cases over years, the police never go and reopen. No, that's it. No, well, they don't like to admit. But if you say, like, this is a, supposed to be a, a two man crime, why hasn't it been reopened? Yeah. Someone supposed to have said in 1987 he did this crime with me. And I've said, nah, that's false because the person at the time was related to me co accused, who me co accused sister. He was involved with her, had one or two kids with her. So I'm thinking, you two have got your heads together and gone right. So if he's saying that, why wasn't he questioned about it? Why didn't the CCRC go, right, we want to interview you? Right, can I just ask you as well? So when you told your solicitor that obviously you, it wasn't you, but you was going to confess because of you know, yeah. threats and stuff and being scared. Mm -hmm. Did they mm. not offer you any support or some guidance or, you know, people to sort of talk to you about that? Or uh, I've had that many different briefs over over the years. I mean, one or two have said, yeah, we be prepared to get a, a, a new psychologist to actually do a proper assessments. I mean, when I had the original one done, it was a proper one with the test. It was a word test, written test, uh, 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 an album test for uh, identifying stuff, a, a verbal test, reading a passage out. So she actually did a proper test. She went and spoke to some of the family to, to get a uh, picture of what happened as, as, as a child. So, their report come up with uh, so many different issues on personality, on paranoia and that. So, the Home Office tried to uh, refute that. They got one of theirs to actually do a report without even seeing me. So, she did try to do a professional critique of it, but didn't work. So at the minute in time, I'm waiting for the new lawyer to actually read the paperwork and come back as to what he's actually doing. If I had stuck with this fella years ago, I might have been back at appeal. But uh, I left him and went up with Jengba, who I thought could have done more to help my case. Okay, the promote cases of people joined enterprise but they don't actually read paperwork so when i come out i met a, a, a kid he took me up to pick me paperwork the boxes of paperwork hadn't been opened so i ended up having an argument with, with one of the founders now i've stepped back another for okay yeah your role is to uh promote the cases that you, you promote in the way you uh, do it. So I thought, okay, so I actually lost about six years through throwing, throwing legal bodies away to go to, to go with other people because I thought them other people could help. But uh, yeah. though they put the, the, uh, the case out there, they didn't actually read the paperwork. You know what I mean? So... And so I then got someone else as a paralegal. He was looking at the paperwork. So when we started discussing getting publicity, she didn't want to know. She's like, that. oh, no, I'm thinking, hang on. You need publicity to put it out there so people are aware. So we ended up getting a proper brief. We sat on it for 12 months. Then didn't do nothing. He used covid when, as an excuse, I said, well, hang on, you've got a phone, you've got a laptop, you've got a uh, whatever, so you could still communicate, okay? He also wasn't well with something else. But the fact he sat there for fucking 12 months and didn't do it, not so I've had to give me paperwork to someone I was originally with who come up with with his suggestions of using Gisley Gear Johnson to 
conduct the psychological profile. But with what we found in the uh, undisclosed like DNA, six slides, if it's possibility that uh, London could be found yeah. and get them to actually test it. And then if, if they test it, approve it, it ain't me. Because whether it's whatever it is that's on the slides, surely you can still get something. Because it wasn't just slides. He said there was uh, powdered blood in bags that they sent to one of the labs. Now, whether this stuff is still uh, available, don't know. But DNA is essential. I mean, I took a, you call it a lie detector test, but it was an eye detector test. Using this, using a com computer, I had to sit with my chin on a on a, a piece of equipment, stare at a screen, and it would configure your eyes. Yeah. And so it show dots and your eyes, and then you'd have to watch this dot go here, there, and there, and then it would get the exact quotation to your eyes. Then you had to answer a question at the top before you could do the test. Now, half the questions were about the case, and half the questions were about any anything else, like family life. But within those questions, which weren't about the case, you had to lie, say false rather than true on certain questions. So if you weren't able to say false on some questions, you'd fail. Also, if you were too slow, you'd fail. If you moved your body, you'd fail. So you're sitting there with your chin on this contraption, staring at the screen, not moving your, your uh, body. I answered every question to do with the case, right? And passed it. And then people are saying that, oh, they don't believe the lie detector test. Now, the lie detector test they were using was the one with that, the strap. I couldn't use that because I'm on medication for high blood pressure. I've been in hospital a couple of times with we thought I was having heart problems. So that is a new updated, but they use it. We've used it in the family courts. We're using it now to monitor sex offenders before they come out. And there's a trial going on to use it for sex offenders in their community to prove that they're not telling lies. So it's like, uh, why do you such an issue? People don't believe it. Only four people were supposed to have passed that test that I've done, which is different to the normal lie detector stuff. If you watch the case of, say, Luke Mitchell, you see him in a room, he's got a, a, a strap going across there, which is not the one that I did. Mine was an eye detector test sitting in front yeah, of a laptop. It picks up the, the eye movement, doesn't it? Like your brain. Yeah, has, uh... yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like when you're Which thinking is, and when it's memory has different sides, what are you looking yes. at? Because then it, it can get on it on your eyes and it can tell because you, you say your eyes don't lie. Yeah. So that is a more accurate, up to date test. So I'm just thinking, well, hang on a minute, I passed it. So why why is it suddenly it's an issue? Why are people being skeptical? It's yeah. used, it's being used. Is a book called Manhunt, and there's a section in there where it actually states it's being used in family courts over here. So if it's being used in family courts, why can't it be used in a criminal court? Uh, why I can't it be used in a I suppose they can if they want to, can't they? They just don't give the people the opportunities that I basically. No, no, they, they don't care. I mean, in fact, uh, remember someone saying this, uh, that uh, they'd rather keep 10 innocent people in prison rather than go and search for the for the one guilty person. And we were watching a programme a couple of weeks ago on one of these crime channels, and there was a fella that was ex-CPS, head of the CPS for the North West. He admitted on the programme that Anything that might help the defence, they withhold. 
I mean, it's like that. Wow, you're actually admitting on TV that you withhold evidence from from cases in which can help. I think, I think a lot of that goes on, doesn't it? Very oh that. yeah. Well, if if we had have got what what was in the statements two hundred and one, we could have questioned people at a trial, but we got stuff which we didn't want us to have because what is weird. Back to the head of the CPS. I actually got it wrong. What he was saying yeah. is anything that weakens the prosecution case, they withhold. So yeah. what they withheld here strengthened our defence. Certain questions could have been asked of, of, of people. Now, we sat down and went through the whole undisclosed evidence and we come up with a load, load of scenarios now whether they're they're true or not we don't know because we we don't know who's actually responsible because you had two people up on the roof that that were working never seen anybody go in the woman who said she's seen an actually struggle was this credited at Nicole accused appeal. So you had three main witnesses who never picked me out on an ID, but picked out me co accused. But his ID parades were false. Mm -hmm. 12 people on his ID parade, it wasn't 12. Should it all be in the same height, the same colour? They, they weren't. So the ID parade on his was abused. Whereas with me, I had three, three parades and not one of them picked me out. Now, it's strange that Lodge Lane at the time is a very busy road. So you can imagine in the, in the morning, you've got Tunnel Road across, Lodge Lane here. So that's the junction. You've got Smith down here and Upper Parliament Street. That is one busy junction. So yeah. traffic coming across coming this way from Lodge Lane to go wherever and coming across from the others to come onto Lodge Lane would have been busy. Yeah, nobody seen a, a struggle. One person, she was discredited uh, evidence. Numerous people said they seen numerous people. Well, there's no proof that it is who actually did the crime. I mean, the fact there's two people threatened, threatened them the day before over dodgy bets. And one of them was aired saying that he's going to be found dead one of these days. Yeah. Now, these two people that were pulled in were known as part of a firm that had previous for robbing betting shops. So why weren't they deter detained longer and their alibis checked out <coughs> proper? There's a lot more weight on that version of events than there is on yours, isn't there? Yeah. He is, yeah. but as, as you say, I mean, look at it like this. Uh, four people give each other alibi, right? Now, the two suspects who were originally arrested, one of them's gone to a house, uh, a friend's in Selborne Street. Someone was supposed to pick them up at a certain time. So they've supposed to have gone in, into town to drop off an eye car. <laughs> so... On the journey into town, so they say, they've stopped the car to let one of them out to run back and pick up the, the driver's car, right? While they were taking that one back and nobody seen him. So this kid's supposed to run back to Selborne Street or wherever in Toxford to pick up a car to go and pick them all up. Not seen. When they took the car back to the higher place, the people in the higher place have only seen one person in, in the car. They didn't see any anybody else. The other person said he got up at well, 10 o'clock, something like that. He was seen tagging up the house. Then he said he didn't go out to a certain time, but he was seen outside the betting shop about, about 11 o'clock. So it's strange that, yeah. that the, the female is flat. He, he was staying in with his bed, was scared for their life, left the flat to go and stay with her brother. Yeah, her ma got her, took her to the police station to change the statement that she'd made 
to say you've got to tell the truth because toxic have been in the community it was people were already asking questions about people who'd already been questioned so he was scared and the mother said you've got to tell the truth i mean right. even how, my how, own, was this, how was this down made your your sort of your feel on life because obviously this my, sort of, my, you know you've been out there some my life is hard. Yeah, I actually, you know what, I'm, uh, I'm paranoid about going out. Uh, I don't socialise much. Uh, it, it's focus, most of my attention is my case. Can't do nothing. I can't go here, can't go there, because until my convictions overturn, I'm under the guise of probation. So anything I do, I could be recalled. Yeah. Yeah. Then you also, I, when I first come out, I was told I couldn't talk to the media that certain probation would interpret it the way they wanted to. So I then got a, a probation who, who I thought was understanding. And I, he said, okay, I haven't got no issues with it. But then when I moved areas because of I had to put an alarm on my flat door where, where I lived at the time. And uh, it was like a video doorbell. So anyone who went past, it it would ping. Yeah. I suddenly started getting people trying the door. And I'm thinking to myself, is this to do with the case? And then where, where I worked, I'd worked there for about two years, no issues. Suddenly I was getting targeted at work over the case. So, I had a group of about 10, 10 or 11 people targeting me at work in the end. I had to give the job up, I had to give the flat up, and I had to move somewhere else for my own safety. So, even though you're out, it's still haunting you a little bit, isn't it? It's still. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a hard time. No, it's a, it's, it's a long struggle. Yeah. I think well, just, just a quick one, mate. If you hadn't done that time for that prison sentence, what yeah. would have been your dreams as a sort of youngster growing up? What, what, what would you want to be in life? What would have been your ideal sort of path? Uh, wow, you know what? That's a difficult question because I, I wasn't much good at sport, even though I played the odd game of uh, cricket for the school, played the odd game of basketball for school. Uh, I would have liked to have got involved in like uh, probably politics because whilst inside I have done a lot of reading, heavy reading like probably what you'd call left wing literature like yeah. the Black Panthers, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro uh, all the revolutionaries in Latin America uh, Marx, Trotsky Lenin, as you get class war, freedom, state what? So I used to read all this stuff and then started reading all the things about Ireland as well. Because in a couple of jails, I used to play football for some of the Irish lads on, on a Saturday on the Red Canal at Long Latin in, in the 80s. Yes. And I started reading the Irish paper, the Anne Flowback. And it, some of these papers give you a different outlook than what you actually see in a normal paper. So you're getting a different version of what's being printed, the propaganda that that they actually spiel. So I would have liked to get in, into that yeah. area. So, right, are you, are you gonna, like, have you already sort of, have you done a book already about your case? Or you no, I'm actually, book? I'm actually in the process of doing one. Uh, I think there's a couple of chapters done. Yeah. Uh, I think we're on the sort of third chapter. Hopefully we can get somebody in there interested to take it on and uh, publish it. Yeah. Which is uh which which would be nice. I mean, to me it's not about money, it's about no. telling your story, telling the truth. Yeah. Claiming your name. Yeah. Not about money. I've turned to that. People say, look, 
I'm not in, interested in money. I haven't got money. We survive on what we get. I say we're quite happy. You know what I mean? We don't go any any anywhere. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> you, you, you just don't know. One day, if a crank, if a crank might just come up behind you and go, "Oh, you're so and so," in it. You know what I mean? So it's uh, we just like to be careful. I mean, I like to be p- protective of uh, my wife. She's a lovely person, and um, I don't want anybody giving her our time because of who who I am. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which would be unfair to her. The, the thing is now, though, in this day and age, there's, there's so many of these miscarriages of justice. Like years ago, people didn't really hear of them when it was covered up, but now everyone's coming out of them. I think people are more, their eyes are open to these sort of things now, aren't they? Years ago, yeah, I, just sort of disbelieved, but now, you know, everyone's, everyone's waking up to it. Yeah, to a degree. But years ago, you used to have the media were involved this day and age, the media are not really paying that much attention. You used to have certain journalists who would every week, week without fail. I can remember being in Scrubs. There was two of the Birmingham Six there. There was uh, someone who was suspected of the Carl Bridgewater murder was there. And every couple of weeks, they'd be shutting out on, on a case. Yeah. I mean, but you don't get it now. It's it's difficult yeah. to get the media really I think, into. Unfortunately, it's just all about the money for them, isn't it? For the media, whoever's going to yeah. pick up the sales, they go for rather than trying to help people with uh, stories and stuff. Well, it's 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 not about cases now, is it? It's just as you said. It's whether they can sell. It doesn't matter if it, if if the ex exaggerate, which a lot of stories are, just to send nationalized so they can sell. Yeah. So they're not in in their trusted I mean I actually see like podcast on on the computer and like I have done a couple myself, try to create a channel myself and explain a few things a, 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 about the case. And I'm like that sometimes thinking all that people seem to make they want to hear is uh what did you do in jail? Did you see anybody get killed? Did you see this, see that? I'm thinking, wow. The the drama and the gossip. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what seems to get the people to actually sit and watch. Engage engage in the story. I've discussed a couple of things like grief, uh, loss, uh, DNA. Uh, I've done a few uh, prison stories and all that. And it's like the prison stories are getting more uh, attention than... Yeah. Yes, but it's it's going, isn't it? it goes like that. Yeah. It's, it's just uh, mad. I mean, remember when I come out, I hadn't been out long, and uh, I'm, I'm in one of my cousins in Toxteth, and I've come out to go up to Lodge Lane with him just to buy a couple of cans because you're watching the football. A police car come round the Crescent, and uh, my cousin went, Before we reach the top of the street, that'll be back. It was back. It pulled up me, said you was mumbling something under your breath. I'm thinking, hang on a minute, you're in a car. Window, <laughs> window ain't down, so how can you say what I'm saying? So my cousin started to argue, I said, don't leave it. So I had to explain to them who I was, I was out on license. So the phone through and oh yes, we're, we're aware of who you are. I think because they hadn't seen me in the area, mm. went like, Stop them, and then he started asking when I when I said yeah I've, I've, I've done thirty six years. He started to ask me questions about Bronson. He said, "Do you know him?" I went, "Yeah." I said, "He's he's okay." I said, uh, "I I said uh, I used to play chess with him, drafts with him when he was on on the special unit at Woodhill and and in all." And he sort of shrunk back in the, in the in the seat, and I'm like scared, like to say, "Oh." Oh, so you were one of those bad ones. I said, no, I was awkward. So a uh, year, yeah. still awkward now. And I, I looked at him and went, yeah. And he went to me, hello, Mr. Gilbert. Have a nice day and shut off. <laughs> I thought to myself, wow, one of, one of them fucking know what? Just walking out of, of the house to Trigino. 
I remember cycling back from one of my cousins because I've been stopped twice. I was cycling from one of my cousins. I, I bought a bike. Uh, one of my brothers gave, gave me a bike. So I'm cycling home from one of my cousins in Walton. And I've gone on to a notorious area in Cantonton to, to go towards mine, which heads towards mine, Shoe Road. I've been stopped by coppers. Now, someone's just had, had a bike robbed. And because I was wearing a, uh, was I wearing a, a black uh, goose, Canada goose top, you went, if it was black, we'd nick you. Because the person who's just nicked the bike was wearing a, a, a black one and it's the same coloured bike. I said, well, it's not. This bike's mine. I actually bought it. I said, it cost me 300 quid. You know what I mean? So I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, so just riding, riding a bike home. Oh, uh, man. Right, right. We, we, we start to wind it up, mate. I'd just like to say thank you for having, having me on and giving me the right. opportunity. It's been a pleasure to have you on, mate, and hearing your story. I hope um, you know, get a lot of viewers viewing it and uh, yeah. sort of support you and back you up. Now, Peter, to, to the people who view it, there's various videos on Ray Gilbert is Innocent on YouTube. If you'd like to yeah. go on and view it, all, all about the case and different things beside the case. I say I'd appreciate if you want to join and subscribe. <laughs> I mean, give me yeah. a chance to... Uh, also got a Facebook page as well, have you, right? Yes, yes, uh, Ray Gilbert is uh, innocent. Yeah. And also, yeah, exactly. if you want these, these uh, web website page as well. Ray D. Gilbert 03 at, at Wixsite, Wixsite.com. So you can go in and uh, do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very All much. Right. Appreciate right, it. Thanks right. for coming on, Ray. Uh, Thank you for having me. You take care of yourself. yourself. And you, get your, uh, okay. you get your name cleared for the future. Thank you, Lee. Nice one. Thank you, bro. Yes, Take mate. Care, mate. I will do. Thank you.